About eight years ago, I went to my first ever Sunstone Symposium. Um, I went all alone. I didn't know a single person there except for maybe a couple of people I stalked on Facebook. Uh, I walked into a crowded session just minutes before it began and sat by a man who was sitting in the front row all alone. Though the room was packed, he was alone, so I took the liberty of sitting next to him and introducing myself. I smiled, reached out my hand, and said with way too much enthusiasm, Hi, I'm Blair. This is my first Sunstone ever. What's your name? The man smiled, shook my hand, and said, Hello, I'm Mike. What brings you to Sunstone? I exhaled and shared with this kind stranger more than what he bargained for. I explained, well... Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I got called into a disciplinary council for talking about LGBTQ issues in my ward back in Florida, and church has really been hard for me since. Um, my husband bought me a plane ticket to Salt Lake and said Sunstone would be really good for me, so I hopped on a plane and here I am, all the way from sunny Florida. His eyes widened and his mouth grinned as he said, well, in that case, I'm really glad you came to the symposium and I hope you enjoy it. I continued and said, thank you so much. It's been great so far. Everyone's been really kind. Honestly, I don't even know what this session is gonna be about. This description seemed cool, so here's to hoping it's a good one. The kind man smiled back at me like he knew something I didn't know and replied, I hope it's a good session too. At that point, the moderator stood up and said over the microphone, it is my honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction, D. Michael Quinn. My new friend, Mike, sitting next to me, stood up and walked on stage as the crowd applauded. Uh, my face turned bright red as I realized that my new friend, Mike, was actually D. Michael Quinn, and that would forever be the story of how we first met. <laughs> Michael told me one evening at dinner that my view that Joseph Smith did not introduce polygamy was bullshit. That was his way of starting a conversation about a topic. I responded by posing the question, if only material that existed on or before June 27, 1844 is considered, what proof existed at the time of Joseph's death to show he was involved other than as an outspoken critic opposing it? This led to a lengthy and interesting discussion. At the end, he remarked, I see your point and understand how you can say what you do. Michael is well enough acquainted with the source material to be an engaging and stimulating conversationalist. Even when there were sharp disagreements and strong opinions, he was capable of respectful give and take. What a great soul was he. So much more a scholar and thinker than most of those debating Mormon history today. His greatest contribution to me was to introduce critical, honest history about the religion I thought I understood. His telling was so at odds with what I believed at the time. I'd read all the LDS histories, biographies, autobiographies, and faith-promoting talks about Mormon events that would be considered the official LDS version of events. When he introduced an altogether different telling, I thought he was a crank with an agenda. He clearly had a chip on his shoulder, I thought. Rather than dismiss him, I checked his sources, bought a new library of materials, many of which were made available because of him, and started a new journey into the religion I thought I understood. After years of study and effort, I recognized that D. Michael Quinn was not a critic of the LDS Church. He pulled many punches. He allowed for faith despite removing varnish and myth that had been added as faith-promoting overlays. Mormonism became much more homely, earthy, and deformed because of his efforts and my own independent research into original source materials. But he and I retained the conviction that Joseph Smith 
encountered God, and as a result brought something new and valuable into the world. It was wrong to excommunicate D. Michael Quinn. Many of his groundbreaking revelations in LDS history are now accepted even by the institution itself. He was by far more of a revelator of truth than the disgruntled leaders who had him removed from their institution. I will miss him, but will not forget him. I admit I owe to him a debt of gratitude. He was a brave man who risked ire when he was cast out of the LDS church and again when he maintained faith in the restoration thereafter. His integrity did not allow him to bend to satisfy either Mormons or anti-Mormons. His contribution to the Mormon landscape will take generations to fully be recognized. We were lucky to have him, a living, modest, and engaging scholar. For that, we should all be grateful. This is Jody England Hansen, sharing memories of dear Mike Quinn. There were a number of times I was able to uh, visit with Mike Quinn. He's been a f good, close friend of my family for several generations, and I loved uh, seeing him at Sunstone and other gatherings. I especially remember a time back in the early 90s when my father and I went and took him to lunch uh, during a break uh, on one of the days of Sunstone and uh, visited with him about deeply concerning things at the time. And I especially appreciate how he spoke of what membership and belonging meant to him and what his faith meant to him. And I will never forget that. But what I really, the memory that um, I especially cherish is the last time we were able to spend any time visiting. It was at a Christmas gathering and um, in a home and I was really thrilled to be able to sit and visit with him. And I wanted to talk with him about his recent book, um, well, most recent book, and some of his thought with, thoughts with that. But he was, he, he just wanted to relax a little bit more. And he shared with me more intimate memories that he had of uh, serving as a missionary uh, when my grandfather was temple president in England. Uh, and obviously this was a long time ago. But he just spoke of the difference it made for him to serve there and how my grandfather would uh, call on him frequently to um, help with the, the work that he was doing there with the temple and also uh, the conversations they had about the temple ritual and how that made a difference. and. And, uh, and it helped me recall the difference it made for me to be taught about the temple by my grandfather from the time I was little, how it was a spiritual opera and the power of symbolism. And to hear him share those fond memories of my grandfather with me so generously um, is, a, is a memory that I will cherish always, along with so many others of such an incredible person as uh, Michael Quinn. Hi, I'm Stephen Carter, the Director of Publications at Sunstone, and I started out as a real Michael Quinn fanboy. I'd been bowled over by early Mormonism and the magic worldview. I'd been enthralled by the Mormon Hierarchy series, and I'll admit it, my eyes were never quite as wide as they were when I was reading Elder Statesman. And then, I got hired on at Sunstone, and I found out that this Michael Quinn guy was real. <laughs> I, I mean, he came to our conferences. He wrote articles for us. And I noticed over the course of helping to prepare our symposia that Michael would go over the presentations that we'd slated, and he'd choose a few to respond to. And I was like, imagine knowing that Michael Quinn was going to respond to your paper. That would totally stress me out. So then one symposium, I found out that Michael had chosen my paper to respond to. <laughs> 
So after I picked my jaw up off the floor, I figured, well, my paper has uh, Joseph Smith in the title. He probably thinks it's a historical paper. When he finds out it's a theodicy, he'll probably want to respond to someone else. So I sent, a paper, my, I sent my paper in to him, and I said, no, if this isn't what you were thinking of, um, you can totally back out of this, and I won't feel bad at all. But he wrote back to me, and he told me that he knew what he was getting into. So I proceeded to freak out. I read my paper over and over again, trying to see it through Michael's eyes. I was cinching down my argument. I was tying up loose ends. I was checking every detail. And then the day came. I actually presented my paper to a packed room, and I was like, who knew I was so popular? And then I realized, <laughs> right, they're here for Michael. And they were, I'll admit it. So when I finished up my paper, Michael got up and he read from prepared remarks. He had actually typed them up. And he actually analyzed my paper. I was astonished. I mean, little old me. It was, frankly, the most honored I had ever felt in my entire life. And dang, he offered some good insights, including a few critiques that he delivered so gently that I didn't realize that they were critiques until I reread his remarks afterward. It's really one of those things I should put on my resume. D. Michael Quinn responded to my paper at Sunstone. That should get me in anywhere, right? So the thing is, he did that for decades. He gave up-and-coming young scholars and historians the benefit of his expertise. He actually put work into it. And I was one of the lucky people who benefited from Michael's kind heart and deep knowledge. And it was a great gift. This is Ann Wilde, and this is my memorial tribute to Michael Quinn. Mike became my hero when I read his Spring of 1985 Dialogue article on post-manifesto polygamy. As a fundamentalist Mormon, I couldn't believe that a well-known historian of his excellent reputation had the courage to put such controversial information in print. Of course, I immediately got in touch with him to relate in glowing terms how much I enjoyed his article and how significant I felt it was and would continue to be. We've been good friends ever since. Our friendship became even closer when in about 1990, he called to see if I would assist him with an essay that he had been asked to write for a multi-volume fundamentalism project being published by the University of Chicago Press. He would be one of over 50 worldwide scholars writing about the fundamentalist aspects of their particular religions. Knowing that I was familiar with countless fundamentalist Mormons, he asked if I would arrange for him to interview some of them so he could obtain firsthand information regarding their beliefs and the culture and lifestyle. Over the next few weeks, he came to my home and met in my living room one by one with the selected fundamentalists <clears throat> who told me they would be willing to visit with him anonymously. Some of them were apprehensive teenagers who had never before spoken openly about their lives. But Michael was able to put them at ease and it turned out to be a very positive experience for each of them. His essay entitled, quote, Plural Marriage and Mormon Fundamentalism came out in the fall of 1992 as chapter 10 in the volume entitled Fundamentalisms and Society. In a June 8, 1992 letter that Mike wrote to me, he stated, quote, in reading over its page proofs, I think it's the best thing I've ever written but an author is never a good judge of his own work. I hope you and the others I interviewed will like it." End of quote. What an honor it was to have had Mike in my home on these occasions where we had a chance to visit and become better acquainted. Through the years, I have realized more and more what an outstanding person he is in so many ways, 
not only as an amazing researcher and author, but especially as a kind and cherished friend. It was with great shock and sorrow when I learned of the passing of Michael Quinn. Um, it just was the last thing I would have expected, and so many are saddened by his passing. I've known Mike for literally decades, and if ever a description fit, it is a gentleman and a scholar. He was both, and constantly showed how he lived up to uh, that description because he was one of the finest scholars that we've had in the church, in or out of the church. Uh, he has, I'm sure he forgot more than I've ever learned about most aspects of Mormon history. He was one of the shining lights in the new Mormon history. Uh, he put others to shame when it came to the kind of research that he did and uh, the, the writing that took a long time but always bore great fruit. Um, Mike knew his subjects and he never left a stone unturned. He looked into everything that he felt he needed to find out to flesh out the story of Mormon history and to even going into the nooks and crannies and uh, the places that were difficult for some to deal with. He did it bravely and with sensitivity and as a believer. Uh, many people don't know that about Mike, perhaps, that with all of the things he found, the flaws in our history and in our humanity, he was a believer in the, the basic doctrines of the church and this was evidenced in his writing and in his uh, daily discourse. Uh, Mike opened up areas that had been closed for a long time and helped others to gain access, uh, just as he had been given access to uh, the, the archives. And he took great advantage of the time that he had when he worked at the church archives. And as I got to know him, I, my respect and admiration only grew. And I also said he was a gentleman. He was always kind. He was always patient. No question was too stupid to ask him. Um, he always gave me a hug when he saw me. And I always loved that. Um, he cared about people. He was very sensitive to their feelings and to their needs. And I saw this uh, so many times I can't even begin to document them. Uh, and wherever he went, he brought cheer and light and helped those who were struggling and those who wanted to know more, even at great risk to his own standing and his own status. Uh, he received a lot of condemnation and ultimately excommunication from the church and yet he maintained his belief and but also maintained his courage in seeking out the truth and making it known to his readers and to those around him and those who listened to him speak which he often did about sometimes difficult subjects or subjects that others were uh, perhaps of less uh, willing to explore. Uh, Mike was a true friend. He was a mentor, not only to me, but to so many. Uh, he left an indelible mark on my life and upon the lives of so many in our community. And his loss is tragic and it's great and will be felt for a very long time. I love you, Mike. Thanks for all you've done for me and for so many others. I remember my first day at the Church History Library. I was a painfully nervous grad student. I walked in and checked out a small microfilm reel and went to the computer and just fumbled over it for longer than I'd like to admit. Um, I even put it in upside down. 
um, all of a sudden a man put his hand on my shoulder and asked if I needed help. And it was Mike Quinn. I was starstruck. The next day I brought my copy of Mormonism and the magic worldview with me to on the train in the hope that he would be there again. He was, and he continued to be there for the remainder of the summer that I spent in the archive. He signed my book and he asked me about my research. A man whose book changed the way I view Mormonism and my own research asked me about my work um, and made me feel like I belonged in the field of Mormon studies. Um, I walked away from those interactions no longer uh, painfully nervous of the archive and also a better scholar. I consider Dr. Michael Quinn one of the greatest historians that Mormon history or American religious history generally has ever seen. Um, Mike made me believe in the power of history, the complexity of people and the magic of the past. And for everything he's done, I'm truly grateful. Rest in power, Dr. Quinn. I first met Mike in 1981. I had just returned to BYU from my mission. It was a great experience to meet Mike. I had never met anybody like him before. That friendship, mentorship, and teacher to me lasted until his death this past month or two. It's hard to talk about Mike. It's hard to express my feelings because of that relationship. But I'd like to talk about the last full experience I had with Mike. And it has to do with the book, Writing Mormon History. I'd asked Mike if he would do a chapter and he turned me down. Mike explained that he was working on his two volumes for new plural marriage within the LDS church. And this was taking up all of his time. He felt he could not take the time to do a chapter because Mike would focus on things. He was always that way. When he would do something, his mind would completely focus on that particular project. Gary Bajera expressed that he needed to reach out to Mike and see if we could get him to do a chapter for the book. We both felt it was important. Mike was a key to having a chapter in that book. So Gary sent him an email expressing this, expressing how important it was. And I think through some guilt, Mike decided it was something he wanted to do and was willing to do. He expressed the feelings that it had to be on his terms, which was always the case with Mike when it came to history. He had to have final approval and he would go through it and make any changes he felt needed. He was not enthusiastic about my making changes. I could make corrections, I could do footnotes, things like that. And so that's what I did as I went through. And I sent those differences to him, made sure he gave approval, and the book, his chapter went to press with the entire book, and we now have that record. It's made up of diary entries and memoirs from 1985 forward with the memoirs. The diary entries actually start before Mike went to work at the church archives, now called the Church Historical Library. He had been working for Davis Bitten, going through diaries and autobiographies of early Mormons. That then became a book that Davis Bitten was editor of. Leonard saw this gift that Mike had in research and in focus, and he hired Mike as his student aide. And Mike worked for Leonard in the church archives while Leonard was a church historian. Mike then went off to Yale to get his PhD. He came back to BYU and became a professor, and that's when I got to meet him in 1981. I'm grateful for Mike. I'm grateful to be able to call him my friend and be able to have my experiences with him. 
I've known Mike for a few years now, ever since being around the Sunstone crowd about 10 years. When I first met him at my first Sunstone, I fangirled him on the steps. I think I overwhelmed him, but he was such a big deal to me because I had become acquainted with him in all the footnotes of everything I was reading. You can hardly miss his work when you're reading Mormon history. He seems to haunt all of the, the footnotes everywhere we go. And to me, that is one of the most enduring parts that we're going to take of Mike Quinn with us. His historical research, his exhaustive historical research is a gift and a blessing to our community and will be for many, many years. My personal memory of Mike Quinn is being able to go down to Short Creek, the twin towns of Hilldale, Utah and Colorado City, Arizona. We brought Mike Quinn down for a conference to talk about the history of polygamy to Mormon fundamentalists and ex-fundamentalists in Short Creek. It was a beautiful experience. Mike spent time talking about history and the 1880 manifest or the 1880 revelations, the hidden revelations, and then the manifesto in 1890. He not only gave a fantastic presentation, but I was really moved that he spent a really long time after talking to people, answering their questions, and I was moved most by his compassion. He was able to connect with a community that was different than him, that believed differently than him, because he had done the research and he understood their history and how they got there, and I was really impressed with the empathy and the curiosity that he expressed, but also the common ground that he tried to build when he was there. And I know that he's been doing that for years, way before I've been around. He's been doing it all over our community in corners of the world that we may never notice. So on behalf of myself and so many in the polygamy research community, thank you, Mike Quinn from the bottom of our hearts for all the research you did and may your legacy and memory live on. To me, Mike Quinn was both a warm-hearted, fun-loving friend of nearly 40 years and a scrupulously principled scholar with an encyclopedic knowledge of Mormon history. Neither the Mormon History Association nor Sunstone will be the same without him, nor will the raucous after parties. When Mike moved to Rancho Cucamonga, California several years ago, we often gathered in Los Angeles for discussions, dinner, movies, and our annual Oscar night parties. This past year, however, our friendship was reduced by the pandemic to occasional calls and texts, mostly when one of us was especially frustrated by Trump foolery. I actually appended a different F word to 45's name and text to Mike, but this is mostly Mormon audience. Mike, I texted in June of 2020. I thought this meme would make you chuckle. Mitt Romney is the only Republican Senator who voted to remove the president from office and the only one to march with Black Lives Matter. He's not riding in on a white horse, but he's got a white dog strapped to the top of the station wagon of decency. Har, Mike texted back, then added, Romney probably didn't apologize for publicly dismissing previous Black Lives Matter demonstrations with the bromide, All Lives Matter. Probably not, I responded, but he tweeted a photo of his dad, George Romney, participating in a civil rights march in the Detroit suburbs during the late 1960s. Force alone will not eliminate riots, Romney the Elder said at the time. We must eliminate the problems from which they stem. Mike, a self-described democratic socialist, mind you, texted back, I thoroughly admired liberal Republican George Romney and would have voted for him as president if his honesty about the Vietnam War hadn't ended his candidacy due to his use of the word brainwashed. Bobby Kennedy was my absolute choice until Sirhan Sirhan ended it. After Romney dropped out, I voted independent rather than support Democratic slug Humphrey. In August of 2020, a more pragmatic Mike texted, as a Democratic socialist, I wanted Bernie Sanders to be this year's candidate. When Joe Biden won it, my first choice for his VP was Elizabeth Warren. My second choice was Kamala Harris. 
Now I hope that Bernie's fans and Elizabeth's fans will cast sensible votes in November for the ticket we have. I'm a pragmatic progressive. A few weeks later, Mike texted, I've been enjoying the Democratic Convention primarily through the hilarious perspectives of Stephen Colbert and Trevor Noah. Trevor has become my favorite in our time of needing comic relief. When I last spoke with Mike in March, we managed to zoom him in to dish about the Mormon Murders documentary on Netflix. Well, in truth, we zoomed and he, typically unable to figure out the technology, joined us via phone. During the discussion, he told us how he first learned about the Salamander Letter, a document later identified as a Hoffman forgery that had nonetheless further propelled Mike's foray into Mormonism and folk magic. Apparently, one of his colleagues at BYU, it was Marvin Hill, if I remember correctly, passed him in the hallway and asked if he'd heard about the Worm Letter. Intrigued, Mike immediately called then LDS church historian Leonard Arrington. When he questioned Leonard about the worm letter, Leonard said indignantly, it wasn't a worm, it was a salamander. As if a salamander were somehow way less weird than a worm. Such a great story, told with delight by a great guy who loved telling stories. I miss him. In the last scene of Cyrano de Bergerac, the protagonist, embattled by life and having grown old, is beaten nearly to death. But in spite of his wounds and a concussion, he manages a final meeting to read to Roxanne her gazette. Blinded by the attack, Cyrano relies on his prodigious memory and wit to recite news that is known only to him. And then, long separated from lost friends, lost love, and causes he once had won, he dies. Cyrano in life was encumbered by a sense of mission and by pride in what he believed to be right. He is best described by what Michael once told me, that he did not care whose ox he gored in his pursuit of truth, dignity, and ultimately an expression of who he truly was, no longer defined by the false expectations of society or a church. Mike and I were friends from when we first met in Glendale, California. I was 12, he was 13, or at least that's what I remember our ages to have been. But since Mike is dead, I can't be sure because I now have no one to confirm for me my Gazette. Michael was my Cyrano. Whenever I needed to know or to prove something about our shared past, as young friends, as roommates at BYU, as first and second counselors in a bishopric, as husbands and fathers, as expats in the religion we loved, as comrades in our evolving faith, I would call Mike, which is not what I'll most miss about him. Our conversations would stretch for hours after he had answered my brief, irrelevant questions, and we would then wander. I'll miss that wandering that was deep as our shared hope, as disappointing as our independent failures, as certain as our confidence that this life is circumscribed by eternal truths that cannot be contained nor dictated by councils nor quorums nor oracles motivated by other than what motivated Michael, what Cyrano called his white plume, integrity, honor, and ultimately love. It is that love and certainty in eternalities that causes me to know that after all he suffered, after all he failed to know but ultimately learned, he has ascended to a place where 
To gore a mistaken ox is to affirm the true faith. He is home. And so, this is my last conversation, a dirge for Michael. When you died, we were somewhere other, further from the room near the wall, the bed where you were discovered, leaning as you had leaned into facts others thought aberrant, the non-observant unkeepers of our myths for whom the keeping is a riddle, what to believe, what not. When you died, we were elsewhere, though not so removed as you have become, but wouldn't have been had we anticipated you so abruptly leaving and without noting the reason or the time separating us to wonder about our sources and how and why and not why. Now you are nearer what we believed of what it is to be wise and we and others asking your advice discover you will no longer advise. So soon and so away as to distinguish and extinguish hope to know what you might say about why you were beside the bed, the wall, the word you once untied as though the simplest knot. We didn't ask you what we should have of the trouble that is breathing, of the worry that is communion, of the complication that is knowing, of the knowledge that is pain. We failed to wonder much about our consequence, the harvest of your brain. And now, too late, too late. Too late for any but regret and the little we will forget the more remember. But who now will remember our lives and past lives in that sacred regression that is our history, our fidelity, our shame? Who now teaches us who to blame or how urgent it is to be brave? Who reminds us to keep the faith when the heavens are so removed and our oracles blind to faith's decay. We cannot now remember our antiquity beyond this remembering you and of you gone and gone the day of you unable more forever not to say